Uh, there's a lot of confusion about what is ACS versus ARIES versus RACES, and so I want to spend a couple of minutes um, uh, talking about that. Um, the, the program has a very long history in Montgomery County. I've been involved since 1978 or thereabouts, so I know about two-thirds of the history. Um, and, and some of that history, I think, is relevant to what's happening today. Um, and th that, but then I want to talk some about what we've done in the last year with, in ACS and some of what we hope to be doing in this coming year or intend to be doing in this coming year. So that's, that's the outline. Um, so what is ACS? The letters stand for Auxiliary Communication Service. And before I say what it is, uh, it's probably easier to start with what it isn't. So um, um, it's not ARIES. ARIES is the Amateur Radio Emergency Service. It's a program operated by the American Radio Relay League. Um, um, and it's their program for um, preparing hams to provide emergency communications. Um, membership in ARIES is open to every ham. Um, it's organi organized by the AWRL sections and, and yeah. districts and then down to the city county level. Um, and there are roles designed in the ARIES program for a section emergency coordinator, a district emergency coordinator for a portion of the section, the emergency coordinator in the local jurisdiction, which is a county or a township or a, uh, or a city, depending on where, where you live. And, and there's also an appointment for an official emergency station. Um, um, and the, the role of the emergency coordinator is it's important to understand to coordinate um, to, to make matches between resources and needs and to develop a core of hams who have uh, tools, skills um, to serve with auxiliary communications or adjunct communications um, yeah, when needed. Um, the AWRL for years has used the motto, amateur radio when all else fails. And I think that's an appalling slogan. I actually wrote an op-ed, which I sent in to um, um, uh, someone on the AWRL staff about, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, and they published it, much to my surprise. Um, but. Um, it's never the case in an emergency that all else fails. Um, and amateur radio infrastructure is just as prone to failure. Our antennas blow down just about as often, if not more often, than the, than the professional communicators' antennas. Often, our repeaters are on the very same towers. So when the tower goes down, we're all off the air, as far as that resource is concerned. And, you know, if we profess that we want to be helping out uh, the professionals who provide public safety communications, and then we say, we're going to be here when you fail, how do you think th they feel about that? Um, it's, it's not the best way to make friends. So um, what, I, what I like to say uh, from my experience in, in emergency communications is that when the definition of a disaster is an event that overwhelms the resources of government to provide basic services to the citizens. And when, when, when the ability of the government is overwhelmed, that includes communications. And so you have extra needs for communications at the same time as your capability to provide communications may be impacted. And you also have a lot of people coming in to support the, 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 the recovery and response and those people need extra communication channels that aren't normally needed. So there's a need for um, supplementary communications, not just fixed, not just um, stepping in to be the hero when the professionals' communication systems have failed. So what's interesting about the ARIES program is that we have these appointed officials, but there's not a lot of guidance from the AWRL about how you should organize, how you should train, and that is really starting to change just in the last few years, and the AWRL has recently announced a new training program for ARIES, which I think is a terrific step in the right section, 
a step in the right direction, if I can keep my tongue untied. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about ARIES. Um, ACS is not the same as ARIES, but they're closely related. Now, what is RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service? Um, that is a radio service defined by the FCC in the rules and regulations governing access to the public airwaves, just like the amateur radio services is a service defined by FCC and the family radio service and citizens band service and so forth. So the, the RACES is an invention of the Federal Communications Commission. Um, and it comes out of the Cold War, War period um, those of you who know your amateur radio history know that what in, during World War II, the, um, the, F, the FCC, or I don't even know if it existed then, maybe it was its predecessor agency, but amateur radio was ordered off the air um, for two reasons. One is that the government didn't think they could monitor amateur communications and they didn't want the ham bands being used for espionage. And the other was, in those days, um, uh, uh, enemy uh, bombers could target on radio signals and if there were a lot of hams transmitting and lots of signals coming from uh, one location that was probably a, where a lot of people lived and a pretty good place to drop a bomb. So um, amateur radio was ordered off the air for the duration of the war and but there were some hams who uh, could be a lot of help to emergency officials, civil defense officials um, um, who, who had volunteer groups who were doing things in the coastal communities. They were patrolling the shorelines. Um, they were monitoring to make sure that, uh, that if your town was supposed to be blacked out during the nighttime, that, that nobody was leaving their lights on, and, and all kinds of other activities. So some of these volunteer teams that were doing civil defense functions really could have benefited from communications and hams could easily have provided that except they weren't allowed to transmit. So the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service was invented by the FCC right after the war and said if we ever have to do this again, um, hams who are registered with their local civil defense organization um, and are licensed, well you had to be a licensed amateur radio operator, uh, you had to have your station uh, recognized as determined in, in the regulations by the local civil defense organization and the operator must be certified as a member of that local civil defense organization and these civil defense organizations in that time were managed by the local government and the transmission any transmission made in the radio amateur civil emergency service had to have been explicitly authorized by a, a civil defense official. So it wasn't like if you were uh, authorized as a, as a member in RACES or the civil defense organization um, that you could transmit whatever you wanted. It wasn't a license to continue operating. It was a license only to pass specific messages um, uh, it, to conduct the business of civil defense. So that was the concept of RACES. And so this idea of you had to be a member of a civil defense organization uh, as this concept was implemented in the 1950s, a lot of the ham groups um, would, uh, you know, kind of self-organize into organizations that they call RACES organizations in each county or city, and they would affiliate that organization with the civil defense, and they say, okay, now I'm a member of the civil defense organization. So, um, so there became this idea that you could belong to RACES, but that wasn't what the FCC said in the regulation. That was something that Hams invented after the regulation was published. Um, so um, the interesting thing is, of course, since that program was developed by the FCC in, in around 1950, we've never been to war and we've never actually needed to use that program. Um, it's really only useful in the event that amateur radio is shut off the air because any other kind of communication that you might need to do um, is perfectly legal under your amateur radio license. Uh, so RACES was really only intended for the one circumstance where amateur radio wasn't available and that was during wartime. That was, that was the idea. Um, but a whole lot of uh, culture and myth has grown up over the decades about RACES. Um, um, 
At the end of the Cold War, um, the, the civil defense organizations, the folks who were doing that work, noticed that um, they were really needed to, rarely needed to provide civil defense, but they were often needed to deal with um, other kinds of emergencies, especially natural disasters, occasionally a man-made disaster. And so the profession of emergency management was invented out of the civil defense profession. Um, okay, so ACS. Now we're getting back to the topic. What is ACS? Well, it's not Aries, but um, in Montgomery County, um, um, the Aries and ACS have kind of joined forces. I guess there's one other thing I should say about the history, is any time um, uh, you have two groups of people doing something that you're not being forced to do by, by, by the king, um, um, you form these voluntary organizations, churches, social groups, whatever, and before you know it, people start to argue about the right way and the wrong way to do things, and then they get mad at each other, and they go off and form another church, or they go off and form another organization. And that happened with races and Aries, too. So it, if you were a member of an Aries group, and you didn't like the way it was being run, um, one of the things you might have thought of, well, the heck with Aries, I'm going to form my own races group and now we will compete um, for the same customers, for the same missions, and for the, for the same group of members. Well, uh, from a public service point of view, that's a very inefficient way to operate. Uh, but in, in many, many jurisdictions across the country over the years, races and Aries have parted ways over a personal dispute between two people with big egos, and then when one or the other of those people went away, then they would form, reform as a Racy's Aries group, or they would take one name or the other, and, and, and these things kind of go back and forth over time. So um, part of the concept of ACS, uh, um, ACS is we have a written memorandum of understanding with the county that was actually signed earlier this year. Um, that that actually states that in the event of a, of, of a wartime uh, emergency that membership at the full membership level in ACS um, uh, uh, with a couple of other conditions qualifies an amateur to, to uh, uh, it's the equivalent of being a member of the civil defense organizations that's, that's spelled out in the FCC regulations. So RACES is um, uh, May, is, the, is the organization the Hams wanted to belong to if you ever want to participate as, as a racist operator in Montgomery County. Um, and, and we encouraged everyone, if you, the way you register for, to be a member of Aries is simply to tell the emergency coordinator that you want to be a member. The emergency coordinator of Aries is Fred and um, and the way we handle that was we encourage those people to register for ACS, and so we keep a uh, we keep one set of books that serves the needs of both organizations, and one training program that serves the needs of both organizations. So ACS is Aries, but then it's not because ACS is not a program of the ARRL, and Aries is. But um, you have to look with a pretty good magnifying glass to find a difference. Um, Emergency communications is not about radio operators and radios. It's about communication systems, how you organize the equipment, um, um, how you plan to use it, how you make interfaces with people. The systems involve people as well as uh, equipment. Um, uh, the Virgin Islands, um, following the last disastrous storm there in 1995, um, there was a call uh, for all the federal responders to get communications on the island for the people that were all over the island. In, in, in most disasters, the, the, Fed, the FEMA folks go to the state capitol to talk about money. Um, in, in the Virgin Islands, the state capitol was the ground zero for the disaster um, on, on that particular event. So the FEMA folks who were used to staying in hotels and wearing suits to these meetings were, were uh, thrust into a middle of a disaster zone where they were woefully unprepared. Um, and there were, basically most of the infrastructure on the island was destroyed. Uh, so they uh, called up Motorola and ordered like 500 walkie-talkies. 
and they needed a bit of hurry, so Motorola said, we'll fly them to, to St. Thomas on our private jet. And they arrived hours later, and these 500 radios, of course being the government, were the cheapest model that Motorola sold. Um, they had low capacity, um, in those days, nickel cad, nickel cad batteries that required being charged on an individual wall board charger for 15 hours, and then you can think about programming the radio. Um, but no one thought of ordering the programmer, no one thought about ordering spare batteries. So after, after two days of programming radios and charging the batteries, and we were starting able to issuing these things, uh, people would go out in the field for a 12-hour shift, the radio would, the battery would run down after six hours, and no spare battery, nothing, no way to plug it into anything else. Um, that, that's buying radios instead of buying systems. Um, and that culture, I can guarantee you, still exists today. When people think about communications, they think we'll get people who are operators, who know how to talk on the radio, and we'll buy radios, and then we'll have communications. Doesn't work that way. So that was really the concept that Stan Harder had way back in the 80s is we don't buy radios and get people who talk on them, we build communication systems. And that's something that ACS is still trying to do today. So, you know, our mission is to develop and maintain a cadre of volunteers who are qualified and equipped to provide a wide range of supplemental telecommunication services supporting our community during disasters and civil emergencies. Does that mean that the county will activate ACS in a disaster? That's kind of the, still the AWRL's model is that the organization will be activated. Our model is that people who have been trained and are properly equipped um, can be um, assigned to a function in the ESF2, Emergency Support Function 2 communications of the incident command system um, to provide a function working with whoever else um, is working in that team. So we, we can, think about developing a, a strike team for it to meet a special need. Um, we can think about developing a cadre of hams who are familiar with the equipment in the radio room in the EOC and can operate those radios and do other things that the county needs that don't involve talking on the radio, by the way. Um, we can do all those things, but our job is finished on the day that the emergency starts because we've done our job to train and equip these volunteers who can then go out and do what needs to be done. And many of those folks then um, are going to see that they are needed when something happens in New Orleans or when we have a tropical storm that causes massive flooding in the valleys of West Virginia. And that's something else we've done in this area is sent hams to, to neighboring jurisdictions to provide support. Um, and one of the, you know, nothing ever bad happens in this area, but sooner or later there's going to be a terrorism uh, mass casualty. Um, we have lots and lots of airplanes and trains carrying lots and lots of people and hazardous cargo running through our community. Um, sooner or later something's going to happen and we're going to need supplementary communication. So there are still roles for ACS today even with cell phones. The, the cell phones just don't work too well down, down in the river valley. Um, especially not with the numbers of people who will be trying to use their cell phone in those locations. So if you don't have um, other means of communication in those zones, you're going to be out of luck. Um, okay, so what are we doing? Um, right now we're still struggling because we're, we're, we're a small organization and we're not utilized very often so it's hard to get people motivated to spend a lot of time. But we do have weekly training nets for hams. Um, we're having trouble finding net control operators to run those weekly nets. We're having trouble finding hams are willing to put in a little time to, to, to share some of their knowledge. And we've got a lot of hams in this community who do have knowledge and experience and could be doing simple short programs. Uh, we have two levels of membership in ACS. One, the first level we call our affiliate members. That's basically the same criteria as the AWRL uses. You just have an interest in, in participating, we welcome you. Um, we require a modest amount of training um, you have to take four FEMA online courses to become a full member and um, your, 
credentials have to be presented to the a ACS board in order to become a full member. And at some point when, when the county and we get a little bit better organized, um, there will be a third level uh, um, where you'll meet additional criteria specified by the county, take some training that they require, and then you'll, be, you'll have a Montgomery County Volunteers credentials, um, a badge. Um, we do have a defined role in the Montgomery County Emergency Operations Plan. Uh, we do now have a written uh, MOU between ACS and the Montgomery County Office of Emergency and Homeland Sec Emergency Preparedness and Homeland Security. OEMHS is the acronym or the abbreviation. Um, um, if you go on the OEMHS website on Montgomery County. Gov, um, you will see a link to our MCACS webpage on their website. Um, and we are not a club, um, but we seek and are grateful for the support we receive from all of the county clubs that operate in the county and the region. Um, and Mark, of course, is the by far the biggest club in Montgomery County, but there are a couple of others, uh, and we're particularly uh, engaged with the NIH Radio Club, um, and there's also the Potomac Valley Radio Club, which is a regional club of, of uh, the HF-oriented folks, who are, are very much, uh, um, you know, a part of our mission. Um, um, many of you have heard about MAPEN. I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a minute, but this is the 21st century now, and uh, 1,200 baud communications just doesn't get very much data, and uh, m most of the folks who are involved in disaster response are used to having a lot bigger pipe for data than 1,200 baud. So we are working to build a broadband wireless network using microwave equipment uh, throughout the Washington area. That's not ACS. That's a separate organization, also a 501c3. Uh, organization um, and a couple of the officers of MAPEN are also uh, well they're in the room tonight uh, they're members of MARC and they're members of ACS but we also have MAPEN board members who um, come from other jurisdictions because it's a regional effort um, so I'll talk more about that in a minute but you know in, in an emergency when infrastructure goes down whether it's ours or theirs um, sometimes you fall back to the basics. In this, in this area, our terrain is very conducive to doing most, most of the communications we need to do on VHF and UHF frequencies. We enjoy the benefits of have having a repeater on just about every repeater pair in the band, on, on all three bands, um, but we also can get pretty far on a simplex uh, radio channel. Um, so um, that's still it's, it's kind of the least common denominator, but almost every ham has you know, a capability on two meters and 440, and so we make use of that. Um, WinLink is a really useful program for sending data over voice channels, whether on HF or VHF, UHF. And so we want every member of ACS uh, to know how to use WinLink when you need to, whether or not you're equipped to do so in your own station. Um, so. Um, we've been encouraging the development of personal go kits and sharing ideas on how to construct them and we have a number of members of the group who have really nice go kits um, and there are other share, shared deployable assets um, we want to focus on all weather capability because emergencies don't always happen when the Sun is shining in fact <laughs> we rarely do um, um, we want to develop community stations you know, Mark keeps talking about having a club station. That would be wonderful. Um, the idea of having a place where hams can assemble and provide support in an emergency, um, you don't want to put the net control at the EOC because the EOC is the place where much of the traffic is originating and terminating. So you want them to be able to focus on handling the traffic and let someone else control the net from somewhere else. And ideally, that's a club station, not somebody's basement. Um, so uh, we've been actually working, the NIH club um, recently got the opportunity to do a major renovation of their 
of their club station and we've been involved with that and uh, it's it's not quite finished but it's looking really good i hope that mark eventually figures out a way to get a club station and and the, and uh, um, the damascus emergency communications team has a model station at the damascus uh, uh, fire station which happens to be a very short building on the tallest hill in the county so it's a really good place to have a, a shared resource like that um, this here is a oh there we go this here is uh, a photo of Ron Adams uh, sitting at the station that we have installed in the EOC at Holy Cross Germantown Hospital and the radios are installed with power supply and a TNC in that box mounted up on the wall um, uh, power coming down the wall and a set of cables that um, when, when you need to use the station you pull the uh, control head for the radio out of storage um, plug it into the cables that are just tucked under the table normally because Ron walks in with his computer um, grabs the control head for the radio and the headset that are stored in a box in the corner of the room plugs in the cables plugs in a USB cable to his laptop and he's on the air with voice and wind link on, on 2 meter and 440. Um, that's, that's been in place for several years. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, Paul and I uh, and Dick worked on this installation quite a bit as well. Finished an installation very similar at MedStar Montgomery Hospital in Olney. That's the old M Montgomery General for the old timers in the room. Um, there are two antennas on the roof, far enough apart that you can operate um, uh, two stations on two meters at opposite ends of the band. Um, and again, uh, with just a couple of cables, we, we still hadn't installed the wire mold yet, um, but uh, uh, the station is now operational. Um, uh, it, we have two uh, Kenwood TMD 710 radios. Um, the idea is that those radios, you can actually operate uh, but, but one, the, those are dual band radios with separate interfaces, so it's basically two radios in one box. So you can be running one link on two meters and be in a, participating in a voice net on 440 um, at the same time using one of those radios. The second radio is a backup in case the first radio fails, but it also provides a, a, the, the opportunity to operate on a different channel on simplex if you need to be talking around to someone in the hospital. Um, maybe the nurse's station, um, or it could be used to communicate with the EOC on a channel. Um, there is a statewide hospital communications plan that specifies the use of uh, a network of linked 440 repeaters that covers pretty much the whole state. So a hospital, hospital communications in Maryland by design um, uses 440 on the set of linked repeaters that let you talk from here to Cumberland or over to the Eastern Shore, um, as long as all the linked repeaters are working. Um, and you know, all the packet resources, digit repeaters and so forth, are on two meters. So one dual band radio um, gives you, you know, two, two functions for the buck. Um, okay. Um, and just, was it last week or the week before, Paul, um, Holy Cross Hospital in Silver Spring had been trying for years to get funding to install a ham station. Um, their folks said we don't want any boxes on the walls in our classrooms um, so they arranged for a contractor to build the same kind of station uh, two Kenwood DM 710s um, you know what I meant TM D 710s uh, mounted in a pelican case with a power supply underneath they did a really the contractor is Teltronic they did a really nice job of this um, the antennas on the roof are cabled to end jacks and end connectors mounted on the wall. So you just run, run the jumper cable from the radios to the jack on the wall, plug in the microphones, and, and you're on the air. Um, and again, there, you know, one cable, one USB cable to the laptop, and you're on, on, on packet. Um, so we now have three of the six hospitals in the county that are so equipped. Um, the, the guy who's the emergency manager for, Silver, for Holy Cross um, is also the chair of the hospital consortium of emergency managers for Maryland Region 5, which is five counties in Maryland. 
and he is working to get a grant to equip the other hospitals in our area with the same kind of system. So, and he hopes it will have all of our hospitals with, with this kind of a setup um, within the next year. And multiply by three, and I think it will actually happen. Um, uh, this is an exercise that MCAs, ACS did a couple of years ago. Um, again, most of our, our area is very amenable to doing communications on UHF, VHF, but every now and again we need to communicate with somebody who's a little bit over the horizon or a little bit over the mountain. Uh, certainly, if we want to get to the eastern shore or western Maryland uh, for a large scale event, uh, we're going to need to use HF. So we did an exercise in October on a very, very rainy weekend, and we actually set up on the parking deck of the Holy Cross Germantown Hospital. They arranged to have us use the top level of the, of the parking deck for the weekend. Um, so we were we had uh, dipoles, NBIS dipoles for 40 and 80 meters. Uh, we set up the station inside of a shelter, one level down, um, and put the generator up on the roof directly above the shelter so the power cord wasn't too long. Um, um, what you hear, see here is two stations that, that th this was actually a wind link exercise to see, um, you know, during the day you can generally communicate anywhere in the state using NBIS techniques, uh, anywhere within 300 mile radius uh, on 40 meters. At night, you have to drop down to 80 to maintain that communications, but usually in the wee hours, the propagation goes away entirely and now you're here in California on 80 meters and if you're trying to talk to somebody on the other side of the state, you're out of luck. So the, the point of this exercise was to try and run, make wind link contacts with the other counties in, in the state of Maryland uh, over a 24 hour period and see how long that con connectivity could be maintained. And, and over, the, over this weekend, it, the, the conditions were such that we were able to send messages anywhere in the state for 22 out of the 24 hours. Um, and this setup, um, by using the canopy with a tent sides, um, a, a small heater kept it toasty warm. Um, it was maybe in the high 40s that night. Um, uh, so there you see Dave with a pile full of radio equipment. Um, and this is kind of interesting and fun. Um, part of his power supply uh, for his mobile station is mounted into the console of his vehicle. And it was easier to take the console out of the car than to take the, <laughs> the, the electronics out of the console. Um, and over on this side, you see um, a rack that is a complete uh, 80 meter to 440 uh, station in a box with, with an automatic antenna tuner for HF that covers a 10 to 1 SWR range and, um, and wind link built in. And I'll show you another picture of that in a minute. So we had two wind link stations running over a 24 hour period with one completely on 80 meters and one completely on 40 meters. And, and we learned a lot about HF propagation from that exercise. So here's, here's the inside of my box and there's, a, there's, there's, there's some other portable go kits that others have developed that are really nice. But um, what you see there is a very ancient Yaesu FT100 which is HF plus 6 and 2 and 440. Um, uh, connected, hardwired to an antenna tuner uh, with a single link box and um, what, is, what else is there under there? Uh, it's my, you know, it's, it's just the uh, shadow. Um, um, but what I've, what I've done with this is that I need to plug one 12 volt cord into the, into here for power. Uh, I have a four port hub here that's powered from the USB port on the, on the computer. So one USB cable allows me to control the radio and do the packet. Um, and then the, the two antenna connectors for the radio are brought out to the back so I don't have to rummage around inside the box with a flashlight to hook them up. So, um, you know, three wires I can be on the air, four wires if I'm operating on both HF and and, and two meter 440. Um, and the, the, the microphone, the power cord are stored in the case. So uh, all I need to do is add a battery or power supply and, and an antenna and, I, and a, a laptop computer and, and I can, 
uh, be, I can be set up and, you know, in just a few minutes after arriving somewhere. And I've used this uh, dozens of times in various exercises over the years. I've taken it to Puerto Rico. I've, I've, uh, um, it's been around. It hasn't failed me yet, but the radio is now approaching 20 years old and it's going to fail me soon enough and I'll have to start over again. Um, back in September, it's an annual event that we've been participating in for a number of years. We set up a booth at an emergency fa a preparedness fair uh, that was organized by Johns Hopkins University and the National Cancer Institute, um, who are next door neighbors in Shady Grove. Um, and they have this event for the employees and students of the university, and they set it up on a day that there's a farmer's market in the same parking lot, so that people coming to the farmer's market will come in and browse the emergency preparedness fair and learn more about emergency preparedness. So um, uh, th this was a joint setup of, of Mark and the NIH club and uh, ACS and the Damascus Mercy Communications team. We had our new Mapin van about which you'll see more in a minute um, set up with a, on HF with a, um, a, a dipole um, on a pulley from the top of the mast sticking out of the truck. Um, this guy here is an NIH uh, disaster researcher in the National Library of Medicine who was, um, um, he, he's also ham, but he was also promoting his uh, uh, research program into disaster communications. This, but the NIH emergency management brass is there, uh, county fire department was there, um, um, FEMA brought some of their communication stuff for show and tell. So we're able to kind of rub shoulders with, with some of our counterparts in the public safety and communications agencies. And that's, that's as valuable as any other reason to spend the day out in the sun. Um, I mentioned MAPEN, the Mid-Atlantic IP Network. This is that other voluntary group. That again, kind of like ACS, it's based on ham radio principles, but we're not using exclusively ham radio frequencies. Um, we have set up a network of microwave stations that extends from uh, Bull Run Mountain overlooking uh, uh, Dulles Airport on, in the west up to, um, the, what do you call it, the Catoctin Ridge? Of, what's the name? Uh, overlooking oh, Frederick. Catoctin Mountain. Catoctin Mountain. Um, and uh, um, the, this, this hub of the network is co-located with the Mark Repeater, as it turns out. Um, we have a link to a, um, a privately owned tower in Ashton that within a few weeks is going to be, have a, a, a link to uh, MedStar Montgomery Hospital. Um, and eventually we want to get all of the county hospitals permanently connected to this backbone so that they have an alternative way to share broadband information. Uh, they can do VOIP tel telephony on this network. They can share large files with impunity because of the bandwidth capacity is, uh, uh, right now at all of our locations, it's comparable to uh, high-end DSL or Fios uh, speeds. Um, what else should I say about that? Um, there's their spread um, on uh, uh, put, putting a dish on the head on the uh, roof of the executive office building across the street last fall was it um, uh, we didn't install the big dish we installed the little dish which is big enough for us it looks like a, a crane operation to put that big dish up um, um, but this dish the small dish that we put up here um, is aimed in the direction of the county EOC which is down in an RF hole in Gaithersburg, and we can't get there directly from our network. Um, we're negotiating with a government agency who has a large facility in Gaithersburg to let us use the roof of their tallest building as a relay point, and this dish was uh, uh, installed in anticipating of getting access to that rooftop, and then will be connected to the county EOC on, on, on broadband. Um, on the right here, you see an installation that's still not quite finished, but uh, um, in progress uh, at the Damascus Volunteer Fire Station. Again, it's only a two-story building, but it's on the tallest hill, almost at the top of the tallest hill in the county. So 
a pretty good location uh, for a microwave backbone. Um, this will uh, provide a link to Catoctin Mountain and to a couple other uh, points that we want to get to. I'm confused. Last week in January, for the first time ever, we participated in Winter Field Day. And again, as I said before, disasters don't always happen when the sun is shining. In this case, it was almost a sunny day, but it was um, it probably got up in the 40s during the day and in the high, mid to high 20s at night. Um, so um, we set up two HF stations, one in the tent, one in the Mapen communications van with its 50-foot pneumatic mast. Um, uh, Jim provided this really cool set of antennas that he should do a program on sometime, Jim. Um, and to keep warm, um, W3TDH has this really nifty uh, expedition tent that's rated for sleeping eight people. It's, it's a 10 feet by seven foot footprint and you can stand up, uh, even a tall person can stand up without hitting the head, uh, over seven feet of head clearance. Uh, and as an extra layer of protection, weather protection, we got three 10 by 10 canopies and set them up over top of the, the tent with, with sides on the canopies. So we essentially had a tent in a tent with a vestibule on the front. And um, one small electric heater operating on the low setting was enough to keep it warm, uh, uh, you know, in shirt sleeve warm inside the, the tent down in to the temperature in the 20s at night. So that, that gave us a little bit of confidence that we might be able to deploy to the field um, if we had to in the wintertime. Um, when, uh, when we arrived at the site at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, I was amazed that there were, what, seven or eight people there ready to work. Um, again, with the temperature well below freezing, uh, we had the station up and on the air by the start of the exercise at 2 p.m., both stations. Um, um, and we had a lot of fun. Um, um, this is a picture of what's currently in the inside of the Mapen van. The Mapen primarily got this vehicle um, for, with the mast and a, and a microwave dish mounted on the top of the mast. The microwave dish has a pan tilt rotator uh, and a camera so that you can sit inside the van and see exactly what direction it's pointing in and aim the dish at a landmark at, on the horizon, um, which is much faster, we found, than trying to use a compass to, to aim the dish. Um, and that's the primary reason that we got the van to, to test microwave links before we go to the trouble of installing equipment on a building or a tower and see if we had a chance of a direct connection. We use Google Earth and other uh, tools available on the web to plan out, you know, possible link paths. But you never know if there's some object like a water tower that's smack in the middle of the path and blocking the, the signal. Um, it, it happens more often than you might think, and those things don't show up very well on the planning tools that we have available. So you have to get out in the field and confirm before you um, put a lot of effort into installing equipment uh, at a site. Um, once we had the van, with this microwave setup, well, we're hams, so um, we, we kind of had to put radios in it. So it has an HF radio, um, it has um, a two meter, a separate two meter and 440 rigs, wind link capability, two computers installed with all the usual software, um, uh, uh, an elaborate AC and DC power distri distribution system, um, so that everything is plug and play. An antenna patch panel made, made by uh, Dave. He also made the patch panel for the Marks Field Day. Um, so um, we enlisted him to do that. Um, and it has a seven, the, the vehicle has a 7KW generator and it has air conditioning. So, um, I, you know, in, in all of my years of disaster response, um, I've always preferred to have equipment in cases that I could transport by whatever means were available, uh, put it in a cargo of an airplane, uh, put it in a compartment of a Greyhound bus, uh, which I actually did once because it was the fastest way to get to where I needed to be, um, uh, um, or you know, put it in a rental vehicle. When, when it's built into a truck like this, 
um, if you have a, a mission that requires that kind of deployable, ready to go when you arrive setup, it's really a great thing to have. But it's also really expensive to maintain. And I've always said this is a bad idea. Um, and guess what? Now I have one. So I, I'm, I'm eating crow. I'm eating crow public in, publicly in front of all of you. Um, it's just a big case, that's all it is. Yeah, but it's much less, you, it'd be hard to put this on most aircraft. Um, I've written on a couple of aircraft that you can fit in. We've written this there. Um, okay, so here's a few pictures of happy, happy campers at Winterfield Day. Um, uh, most of the faces you probably recognize, and um, uh, I won't dwell on that. Am I going backwards? Uh, here's one other project. Um, a, a number of years ago, the county um, took a surplus 400 meg um, repeater and re-crystalled it for uh, the 440 amateur band and uh, and we've been using it under the WA3YOO call sign which is actually a, a, a racy's call sign from the 1950s thank you very much that we've that we've kept active for all that time the FCC no longer gives out racy's call signs but uh, they they still recognize the ones uh, for historical reasons so uh, even the call sign is a is a antique at this point. Um, but um, what about a year ago, the, the the repeater, 20 years old, gave out, and uh, uh, was it Larry uh, who donated? W A three K O K. W A three K O K. If you didn't hear that, um, donated a, a Motorola repeater that he had in his basement, um, and and got W A three Y O back on the air. Um, in the building across the street, which is actually a pretty good repeater site. Um, so, you know, our goals in the coming year, we're, we're going to do Winter Field Day again. Um, we have a number of exercises coming up with various hospitals and county agencies in the next couple of months because spring is disaster exercise uh, time in the emergency management profession for some reason. Um, um, we have as a goal to improve our relationship with the, our counterparts in other jurisdictions. Dave, really glad you could make it tonight. Um, um, we want, we're, 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 we're looking for more people to get active in the program. There are so many things we could do if we had more volunteers. Um, it would be really great to explore amateur radio as a bridge to social media. And there's been a lot of talk about that. I don't know anyone in this area who's doing it. Perhaps they are and we just don't know about it. But if we had a volunteer who was willing to take that on or a group of volunteers and explore it and come with some ideas and we could try them out, maybe partner with CERT, um, that would be terrific. Um, one of these days, I hope that we have enough volunteers that we can develop a portable VOIP phone switch um, that we can de de deploy to a staging area or a disaster scene, like an airplane crash site. Um, um, one of the things that's in my experience, almost always overlooked in field operations is AC power distribution. So you go almost anywhere after a disaster, uh, whether it's a Red Cross shelter or a shelter operated by another organization or a staging area for, for public safety or a, you know, a medical facility, what you see is a generator and a mass of extension cords. And what you see right up here is a bunch of 18 gauge extension cords strung together in a, in a haphazard way. That's not necessarily you want something you want in a medical facility. And it's not a radio mission. Um, it's not even a communications mission, but we technically or in at HAMS ought to be able to figure out and build a, um, a deployable power distribution system that would interface with anything from a 6KW portable generator to a 50 kW uh, generator mounted on a trailer and and provide uh, safe um, uh, appropriately capacity with proper fuses proper grounding proper ground fault um, protection um, to any facility who needs that and and by the way we might even think about providing lighting because it tends to get dark at night in some of these locations um, in a widespread power outage, which is one of the major scenarios that, that's eventually going to befall our area, um, it'll be really dark at night. Mm -hmm. And 
your idea is here. There are so many things we could do. Um, if we just had a few folks who are willing to put a little bit of time into something that interests them. Um, okay, that's that's all I got. Questions, comments? Can you talk a little bit about the availability, um, locations, and any peripheral costs for the ACS trainings, uh, the lottery training? Uh, you, you mean the, 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 the training that I talked about for full membership? Yes. I'd be happy to do that. Um, the location is online on your very own personal computer, laptop, or telephone, and the cost is free. Um, these four courses, ICS 100, 200, 700, 800, are kind of the um, uh, ticket for entry into any uh, disaster response organization, be that, and even the ARRL has now made it a requirement for their uh, leaders um, just recently to take those four courses. And, and I think they're going to be encouraging every member of ARIES to have those four courses. And I would certainly encourage every ham radio operator to have those four courses. You can do it at the convenience of your own time. It only takes a few hours to do each course. And it, it gives you an introduction to the language and philosophy of how not only disasters, but every major event from the you know, presidential inauguration downtown to the Montgomery County Agricultural Fair, they're all run using ICS principles. So having those four courses is at least an introduction to the concepts. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just foundational. That's it, I guess. We're, we're, we're out of here. Thank you all.